Hello and welcome to the Polygamer Podcast, where we explore issues of equality and diversity in the gaming industry. My name is Ken Gagney, and I am your host. As Polygamer airs every other week, this will be the last episode before PAX Prime, which you should totally be at, unlike me, who won't be, unfortunately. I'm Boston-based, so I tend to go to PAX East. But if you're at PAX Prime and you want to explore issues of equality and diversity, oh my gosh, you have like half a dozen panels to choose from. Here's a small listing of which ones you should check out. Friendly Fire on the Diversity Battlefield, hosted by Benjamin Williams, who put me in touch with Tifa Robles, who was on my own PAX East panel. Creating Diversity Playgroups by Tifa Robles. Awesome. Not My Problem, Why Everyone Has a Role in Promoting Equality. Top Women Game Characters of All Time by AJ Glasser, formerly of GamePro. And also Women in Game Development, We Have the Best Job Ever. And Women Surviving and Thriving in Games Media. That's just a short sample of the panels that are going to be out there. I know there are more, but the PAX schedule search function is broken, so those are the only ones I can find. If you want to check out some other resources for equality and diversity, there are some podcasts I recommend. Polygamer, that's this one, obviously, but we also have an audio edition. Did you know that? You can listen to this show on iTunes. In case you don't want to glue your eyeballs to the YouTube video for an hour, you can download the MP3 and listen to it while you're cooking, driving, cleaning, jogging, whatever you want. There is an audio edition you can click in the show notes or in this annotation if it's turned on, which it isn't for your mobile devices. So check that out, polygamer.net slash iTunes. Some other podcasts, Less Than or Equal, found at lessthanorequal.com. On this audio show, host Aline Sims interviews those who are doing awesome things in geek culture, despite not necessarily being well represented in their industry. So we're talking about science fiction, game development, comic books, pretty much anything that is geeky, she will be exploring. So more than just the games that Polygamer explores. Her first guest was Brianna Wu, who was on the PAX East panel I moderated, which inspired the founding of Polygamer. So some great synergy there. Also, superbonusgamerworld.podbean.com is the host of the Super Bonus Gamer World, which is hosted by Matt Kahn, who was the first guest on this show, and I was the second guest on his show. So on that show, they talk about geek culture, gaming culture, and the intersection of being gay and being a gamer, just like Gamer X did, the convention that Matt Kahn runs every summer, or has been. He is also on Patreon, where I am a proud supporter, so if you want to check him out there, do that as well. Super Bonus Game World has had only two episodes, and I think Less Than or Equal has had uh, six, and this is Polygamer number four, so there's a lot of great podcasts for you to listen to. Speaking of which, I have another one. Polygamer airs the second and fourth Wednesday of every month, and Indie Cider is my other show, which airs the first and third and fifth Wednesdays. It's not really about equality and diversity, except in the case of that I'm still representing the underdog by talking to indie game developers. So on each episode of Indie Cider, I play an indie game, whether it's for Mac, Xbox, or iOS. And then while I'm still playing the game, I bring the game developer on the show and talk to him or her about the decisions they made to make the game that I'm playing at that very moment. Why does the game work this way? What challenges did you encounter? Will, will there be a port? How will that be any different? It's pretty cool to talk to someone about their creation while you're experiencing it. So check out that on indiesider.net slash YouTube for the YouTube playlist of all the videos if you want to see the game being played. Or if you just want to hear the developer interview without any visual component, you can check that out at indiesider.net slash iTunes. Again, the links will be in the video description. So if you want to check it out there, please do. In the meantime, let me introduce this week's guest with a word of warning about the technical issues that we may have encountered. We had a little bit of background noise with the audio in the first two minutes of the show. We very quickly cleared that up. And about the same time we did, the video kind of got all green seasicky. I don't know why. Also, we had to record the show on Skype instead of Google+. Plus. Google+, Plus alternates the video based on who's talking. So instead on Skype, there's just the one video. And you'll not be seeing a lot of ping pong effect between the talking heads. And my green screen probably won't be put to good use. But... Otherwise, it's a great show. In fact, the content, the content was just wonderful. I had so much fun recording this interview. And the audio is crisp and clear after the first two minutes. So if you want to check out the audio edition, that might work well this week. But please stay tuned for another wonderful episode of Polygamer. Send any feedback you have to feedback at polygamer.net. Welcome your feedback. You can also send audio feedback at polygamer.net. There's a little widget up in the corner and you just click the button and it starts recording your computer microphone. So if you want to send feedback that way, we can actually play it on the show and that's your way to be a part of the show. Anyway, thanks so much for watching and here is this week's episode.
So today I have the pleasure of interviewing Ms. Sherry Grainer Ray. She holds a number of titles over the history of video games and the development industry. She is the co-founder and on the advisory board of Women in Games International. She is the CEO and founder of Zombie Cat, currently a senior design advisor at Shell Games and author of Gender Inclusive Game Design. Did I miss anything, Sherry? No, that's, that, that covers it. Gosh, and you've been in the industry for 25 years now? For years. <laughs> yes, I started in 1989. Wow, well congratulations on your first quarter. It's, yeah, it's kind of crazy that I'm, I work with people that I've actually got games in the industry that are older than they are, and that's, that's, it's kind of strange. Uh, you've worked for such companies as Electronic Arts, Origin Systems, Sony Online Entertainment, and Cartoon Network on titles like Star Wars Galaxies, Ultima, and Nancy Drew. Those are some pretty high-profile games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, done a lot of really fun stuff. <laughs> so what I want to speak to you most about today is your book, but before we start with that, I want to hear a little bit more about the Women in Games International. Can you tell us about this organization? I sure can. Women in Games International was founded uh, by, there were five of us that were the founding members, when we realized that we needed to provide an organization for women to find a safe space to express their opinions and to find their voice. We found that uh, back when we founded the company, the number of women in games was very small. And when you are one woman in a company of 300 or two women in a company of, you know, 400, you find that your voice gets lost. And you also begin to think that you're the only one out there, that there just aren't any other women. And we found, we had our very first women in games a conference was in the first conference ever held in the U.S. for women in games was held here in Austin, Texas. And we had 165 women show up, which blew us away. We had no idea that we were going to have that many women actually show up. And the energy was amazing. Where all of a sudden we had women finding that they had other women to talk to about their passion, about making games, you know, and, and the energy was amazing. And I knew at that point that we had to have a space for that energy to continue. And that was the basis for founding Women in Games International. So this is an organization for professionals in the industry, not necessarily for the end users, the, the gamers. It, it wasn't necessarily for the gamer. It was for the women in the industry or women who wanted to be in the industry. We, we, at that point, that's what we were focusing on. And that's where it's still focused today. And it's, not for, it's for not just developers, but artists, writers, anybody in any capacity? Anybody in any capacity in the industry. It's also not just women. One of the one of our very important points when we founded the organization, particularly that very we set the tried to set the precedent at that very first conference, was that all of our panels were were mixed gender, at least fifty fifty at least, uh, male female, and we included other you know, the trans community, and we, we made sure everybody had a voice at the table because if not, we just became an echo chamber, and we're only talking to ourselves. And we knew that if we didn't include everybody in these conversations, that change would be very slow, if possible at all. So we really wanted to make sure that everybody knew they had a voice in this. Anybody who has any interest in the issues surrounding women in the game industry were invited and welcome into Women in Games International. And does this organization have annual conferences or newsletters? Primarily what, they, uh, what Women in Games International does now is they sponsor uh, networking events at industry events such as Game Developers Conference, uh, Casual Connect, and those kinds of things. And they provide opportunity for women to, to form chapters in states and places around the world. So, again, providing a safe space for women to find their voice. So how does one go about joining the Women in Games International? Women in Games International does not have a membership option per se. You don't actually join the organization. It, it is a organization that allows anyone to come to their events and participate. So you don't have to, there's no membership dues, there's no membership fees, there's no form you have to fill out. You simply attend and then they build a mailing list from there and let people know when their next events are. Is there sort of an online community or email list? They, at this point, they have always uh, worked cooperatively with the IGDA's Women in Game SIG uh, of which I was also one of the two founding members. And uh, they used the IGDA's Women in Dev SIG as their mailing list. And this was done very purposefully. We did never wanted there to feel like there was divide in the community. We didn't want people to think that 
the Women in Games International was attempting to take the place of the IGDA or take the place of the women's SIG, it just allowed us to do things that the IGDA at that time was not in the position to do. Uh, the IGDA wanted to build themselves at the time as a very open organization that supported everybody. And so if they they couldn't just do a scholarship just for women or do a mailing list just for women or do anything just for women. They had to make it, or they felt, and at the time they were correct, they were to be an organization for everybody. So we stepped off to form kind of this group off to the side that could reach out and do, uh, do events and do things specifically for women without compromising anything the IGDA stood for. But we did want to work hand in hand with the IGDA SIG, and they still do. And this organization's goal is to bring more women into the industry or keep more women in the industry? Yes. <laughs> all these things. It's all of above, all of the above. It, as I said, it's a place to, it, it really is just to give women a safe place to have their voice and to find their voice and to understand that they're not the only one out there doing this, not the only one out there dealing with any of these issues. It also has a tremendous uh, mentoring ability. Uh, MentorNet is, was uh, founded by the Women in Games SIG and the Women in Games International, where women could find other women as mentors. And also, again, not gender specific. If, if men want to come in and mentor or be a mentee, uh, they're welcome. And uh, that was founded by those organizations working together. Lovely. And where can we find this organization online? Uh, mentornet. Dude, I want to say it's .org, but it's Mentornet. Okay. And the Women in Games International? Women in Games International .org. Ah, how easy to remember. Thank you. Easy enough. <laughs> and of course, the IGDA's uh, Women in Games Development SIG is uh, under IGDA.org slash women. Wonderful. Thank you. So we could do an entire interview just about these, this organization and the various events it presents at, but I just finished reading your book and I'm really excited to talk to you about <laughs> it. So if we can move on. Sure. Probably. So I, I, you know, this is pretty much how I discovered you through this book. And when I started reading it, I was overwhelmed by the number of great ideas that are in here about how to Thank make you. games that are more inclusive to both genders. Right. And I thought, why isn't the industry doing this? And then I looked at the copyright date and I saw that it actually was published 11 years ago. Yeah, I can't believe that. 11 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, uh, in fact, it's not being published anymore. I'm in the process right now of securing the rights uh, to do a second edition and to have it available electronically. But uh, I'm in working with the publisher right now to do that. So look forward. There, there should be a second edition soon. It should be available electronically. I'm hoping within a year, uh, but, you know, working with rights with publishers can always, you know, so show something that should be done carefully. Yes, legal contracts can be very tedious, and you want to make sure you get it right the first time. Want to do it right, that's right. And they, they, uh, nothing, the publisher has been nothing but good. I've enjoyed working with them. I just, they're, they're moving on to doing other things, and, and so I'm working to secure the rights back. And the publisher is right here where I am in Massachusetts, isn't it, Charles River? Uh, they were bought by Cengage. Oh, and so okay. they're now part of Cengage, and Cengage is going through a transformation right now, too. So it's a lot of things going on. I don't have any more details than that. I just know there's a lot of things going on with them. I have several colleagues at Cengage. I'd offer to help, but I figure I think I would probably just make things worse. Yeah, I think it's just one of those things. We'll just we'll let the legal people handle it. And like I said, it's not anything contestuous. We've had nothing but a good relationship. It's just they're going through some transformations, and so I, you know, I want to sure. get the rights back and move on. I think it's time to do a second edition. I think enough has changed in the industry. And there's things like uh, when that book came out, MMOs were not, there's no one to talk about MMOs in there because there weren't really any big MMOs or there really wasn't any data yet from the MMO world. And Nikki stuff wasn't done. And so it was just beginning to be done. And so, you know, there's a whole bunch about MMOs and of course, casual and social games. I mean, you can just write a whole book on women in casual social games alone and it's not in there. So I want to make sure some of that stuff is covered. And I want to do um, some interviews with some women who have since gone on and done some additional work past what I had done, uh, which is just really exciting to me. Right. I mean, we've had the rise of mobile games, World of Warcraft, and so many other female developers who have made names for themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And before, like I said, we were two at, you know, a company of 300. And now <laughs> it's nice that we're seeing that we've got enough um, critical mass, I guess you'll call it, to, to actually be out there and be seen and not be so, as, as so completely uncommon as we were, you know, 25 years ago. So when this book came out, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, social media didn't really exist. Nope. What sort of response did you get from the community to this book? 
<laughs> well, there's two. If you go and up to Amazon and take a look at it, you can see the beginnings of some of the kickback that we get today in social mm-hmm. media. Um, I was kind of blown away by some of them because some of them are really nasty and really ugly, and they're accusing me of all kinds of things. Of you know, and I and I always want to say, guys, did you read the same book? That I wrote because I don't know where you're coming from. With these things that you know, saying I'm trying to push some feminist agenda. It's like I'm trying to show you how to make more money. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I want some of that money, and I for my company. And so you know, I just want to make this industry successful. It's, I'm not after any kind of agenda or anything. I'm just trying to help you make more money. And and so, but you can read. So yeah, some of the kickback we see today, you can see the beginnings of it in the comments in my book or the yeah, it's the reviews. As I should say in the reviews. Uh, I read all the reviews on Goodreads and on Amazon. My favorite was from Mr. Stephen Morrish, who says that your book should have been titled How Ugly Brutish Men Can At Least Appear More Sympathetic to Women in the Sexist Violent <laughs> Games They Make. And I'm like, what book did you read? Because <laughs> that's not what I wrote. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's pretty amazing how uh, I never expected that when I started because I actually before the book I actually started speaking on the women games. My first actual speaking event was SIGGRAPH in 1995, and I know that because I still have the T-shirt. And I actually had people protest my presence there. Really? Yeah, and I was talking about women in games and making games for girls, and and I couldn't figure out why. Why would I? Should we not be talking about this? This is a whole. I'm talking about at the time a completely new market, and and I it, I had people protesting that I should not be there for uh, yeah, and so I was blown away, and I was blown away by some of the the reviews. I had no idea I was going to get that kind of you know pushback and the from the reviews. It's just it's just kind of ridiculous, and uh, yeah. Well, the thing about I'm Amazon, sad. Amazon critics can be anonymous, but what about other developers? Did they buy into your book? Um, actually, yeah, the, the development community was pretty accepting of, of what it did. It, it showed up on a couple of, uh, well, first off, it was nominated for a Game Developer's Choice Award. Uh, so it was nominated uh, the same year as Raph's Theory of Fun. His, his book actually won, but I feel very honored that I was nominated at the same time he was. It's been listed on numbers of uh, top 10 books developers should have on their shelf. So it it really got a really pretty good response. But the funniest response it would get is, man, this stuff is great. I'm sure somebody is doing it. <laughs> but not us, because whatever reason. <laughs> you know, they had right. that they couldn't that they couldn't think about, you know, taking their female audience into consideration. You know, it's like it's like the whole Assassin's Creed thing was like, oh, it's so expensive, so hard to do female animation. It's like, seriously? <laughs> no, it's really not. It's not that much more money, guys, really. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, you mentioned you do mention that in the book that having additional avatars does increase, you know, some of the expense and storage. But everything has become so much more accessible and affordable nowadays. Yep. So I, I, you know, I can imagine that some of these excuses might have worked a decade ago, but now I'm not quite so sure. You mentioned that this book is focused on expanding the market. You have everybody's best interest in mind, and one of the predictions you made in this book was that the game industry. <laughs> if it excludes women, will outgrow its market, resulting in loss of revenue and ultimately contraction of the industry. Yep. Now it's 11 years later. Has that come to pass? Uh, no, because we found casual and social games. And that, that casual and social games was one of the first really big forays to where it really opened up the female market. And so that, that, was, that was huge. And so they did. They started catering to the female market. And look at this huge expansion that we had. And we didn't. We didn't have that. So I'm, I'm actually... Really, really glad. I'm glad, and I'm there's there's ups and downsides to the whole social market, but I'm sure we'll get into that as the next questions go on. You you just said how social and casual games cater to the female market, but were they designed to do that, or were they just working within the restrictions of, say, mobile devices? They, um, they kind of fell into. I don't think they ever intentionally said, "Okay, we're going to make casual and social games for women." They just hit upon formulas that really worked really well for the female audience, and they picked it up, taking a lot of things into consideration. Really picked up and ran with the female market, so it, it kind of accidentally found itself. But I'm just glad that it did. Hmm. Now, why is it that casual and social games hit that market? Because very often in your book, you talk about how. To make games more gender inclusive, they need to be more story driven, have more emotional tie in. But games like Candy Crush don't do any of those things. Right. And I'm going to correct you on that. The book actually doesn't say it should, that, that to attract women, that games should be more story driven. It says that we do need to provide emotional ties 
to games, not necessarily story. That's that's different. And actually, what happened with the social and this casual game is they did add the ele- they did add the emotional element, and that is your real world friends. Ah, and that's okay. why that's a big, huge part of why they did it. The other thing it does, and this is something I don't talk about in the book, and it's one of the things I go back and explore. I, I think I touched on it briefly. Is the fact that. Uh, it comes down to timeshare, and a lot of social and casual games deal with understanding how players use their time and how they use their time in game. Women, and this, this goes back to some of the real basic stuff in there, women uh, don't necessarily see PCs and things as, as entertainment medium. They see it as productivity mediums. Uh, that has changed a lot since I wrote that book. That was a real strong issue when I wrote the book. I it was Women looked at computers, and if I said... You know, do you want to play? Uh, what kind of game would you play on your computer? They'd look at me and, and, and say, I work on one of those all day. Why would I want to go home and play a game on it? I might as well have been asking them if they wanted to play a game on their microwave or their 10 key. But that's different now. We're starting to see a change in there. But we still have the problem that women still carry the majority of the housework and childcare work. So their leisure time is much smaller. They have a smaller share of leisure time than, than men do still to this day. And so the so- social games gives them something they can play in small bites depending upon what their time schedule allows. Now, yes, there are some people, men and women both, who play Candy Crush for hours and hours and hours on end, but most of them will play it uh, on a lunch hour or during a conference call at work and things like that. So it takes into consideration a smaller timeshare, which just broadens the market in general, not just for women, but it broadens the market all the way around. It allows people to play that don't have six hours a night to dedicate to World of Warcraft or Hours and hours and hours to get dedicate to Eve, you know, which is a, a time based leveling system. It allows you to play in small time chunks, which caters, which opens up your market in general. So now that we have casual and social and mobile games that attract the female audience, and traditional hardcore games that attract the men, is there still work to be done? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is, I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question. One of the things we have to remember is the, the, everybody is kicking around. We've heard this now for about the last two years is 48% of gamers are women. And we just heard the big one that just came out, uh, so I was, an article being kicked around Facebook right now about that women over the age 18 outnumber boys, uh, ages you know, 13 to 15, I think. And that, that, so this, this is a big deal. Well, that's fine. And you can say 48% of gamers are women, but you have to understand that does take into consideration the numbers from the casual and social market. There are some estimates that say the casual and social market is up as much as 70 to 75% female. So if you take 70, 75% female in the social and casual markets and average it with the traditional markets, which still run about 20% female, You come up with this nice 48% of your gamers are women. That does not mean 48% of Call of Duty players are women. It doesn't. We still have – so if we want to still continue to open those up, and and I'm not talking about making Call of Duty pink or putting lipstick, you know, shopping in, you know, Gears of War. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about understanding what barriers are in your game that keep you – or keep keep you from having a certain market share and t- see what of those barriers you can take down while keeping the genre of your game intact. So if we know that women like, you know, purple balloons, we don't have to put purple balloons in Call of Duty, but we can do things like, let's look at our tutorial structure. What does a tutorial for Call of Duty look like? How big of a barrier of entry is that to not just women who don't have a history of playing those types of games and for whom the control system might be a little more uh, a newer thing, a little more uphill climb for them to understand. Not that they can't, but that they just don't have the history with it. And there's guys out there that are the same way. So how many people is the tutorial structure stopping? And, you know, if doing your, a tutorial in a different style opens up your, a market share for you, why wouldn't we do this? And Call of Duty is, is, you know, or Gears of War or, you know, Grand Theft Auto or any of the what we would consider to be traditionally male games. We can do things that open up their market and just by using inclusivity and reaching out. So, so again, it's not about painting in pink. No, certainly not. And you list a lot of great ideas in your book, like, you know, adjusting the tutorial and the documentation, allowing players to choose their own avatars. One game that did allow the choice of your own avatar was in Mass Effect. You could play as, you know, male or female Shepard. Yep. And, Yay! <laughs> and that, Finally! You know, 
And even though I, you know, I misinterpreted the statement about a story-driven game, I would say that was still a story-driven game that yes. represented that the gender of the main character doesn't matter, really. Yes, absolutely. I'm so happy to see that. That's fabulous. Because I'm sure that if somebody such as yourself came along and said to gamers, we're going to take Solid Snake and make him female in the next Metal Gear Solid game, there'd be probably a little bit of outrage over that. But see, I'm not sure that you should, it's not, we're going to take him and make him female. It's we're going to take this character and give you a gender choice. So if you want to play a male as you can, here's something interesting. If you go look at a lot of the research that's being done right now, Heidi McDonald has done a bunch. Nick, you did a bunch, of course, in the MMO world. There is a huge number. I I want to say the number is 60%, but I, but I would have to go get the actual number on that. But it's something like 60% of males will play a female character. So, I mean, how many guys do you know that played the female ship, right? They, they, so if by adding a female character, not only gives you a better shot at bringing in a female audience, but also makes the 60% of your male audience, why wouldn't you do this? <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just opening it up and making it accessible. And giving the players what they want, giving the players choice. And that's what game design comes down to at the end is just making sure you give your players the choices that you can. You know, and I'm noticing a lot of trends in all these interviews that I'm conducting. When I spoke with Keisha Howard, she asked me if I was okay playing a female gamer and I said, or a character. And I said, absolutely, it doesn't bother me at all. Or, you know, when I spoke with Matt Kahn of GamerX, I asked him, why do you need to see yourself in a character? Why can't you just use it as a form of escapism? And that's a question I had at one point in reading your book. You were talking about a theoretical game ah. design document where you could play as one of King Arthur's knights. And you said, yes. that's the original document. Let's rework it so that you can play as your own character and you meet King Arthur's knights. Because let's say that instead you did the gender swap. You made one of the four knights females, that now there's a character the women can play. And you said that the women wouldn't enjoy playing and enjoying right. just a quarter of the game. And my first yep. thought was, why do they have to be limited to enjoying just a quarter of the game? Why can't they play as a male character and enjoy that? And then you got into the power pyramid. Yes, <laughs> the and, pyramid and, of power. And, and let me tell you it something. Made sense. I get more people that push back on that pyramid of power. And it's like, dude, people, that's not me talking. That's sociology 101. Just go talk to a sociology professor about the pyramid of power. This is not me. This is sociology 101. It's, 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 it's out there. And I just took it and applied it to gender roles in, in, uh, in the games. Mm -hmm. It's, and also, and, and there's so much documentation now. What I really love is there's so much documentation now that I didn't have back when I wrote this. Nikki's work, uh, Heidi's work, so many of these works that will show you up front, just women do not choose to play male characters. They just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, there's, sure, of course there's a percentage that do, of course. The bigger percentage doesn't. They just mm -hmm. don't play it. And so, if, if they just take their money and they, they leave, <laughs> like, no, stay in my game, play my game. If all I have to do is make a female chef to get you to stay and play in my game and I get your money, why would I not do this? When you just mentioned how, you know, this book isn't necessarily you talking. This is Sociology 101. And that's actually one Some of the of things it. I loved about this book because there's been so much talk about the gender divide in games online. And very often that those narratives are very personal and very emotional. And there's definitely a place for that. And those are very valid experiences. But this book, it just felt so much more factual to me and, you know, not, I mean, certainly there is a personal stake in this matter, but it, it didn't feel like you talking. It felt academic and it was such a nice change from everything else I've seen and read. And yeah. especially, especially in that it was also hard copy. So I could read this without having to scroll down to the bottom and look at the comments. Right, exactly. It was just, it really was designed as a book for developers who want to expand their market. And, and. It came from the fact that I was seeing our industry make mistakes that was cutting off money that we could be getting. And I'm like, I mean, it sounds terribly mercenary, but it's like, I love my job. I want to keep my job. I want other people to be able to have this job. And to do that, we've got to keep our markets growing and expanding. Why wouldn't you do this? <laughs> and then I get, I get so much pushback. Oh, I'm sure somebody's doing it. We can't do this because of whatever reason they come up with that they can't do it. And I'm like, but. But uh, it's money. <laughs> We're talking about survival of your company, survival of this industry. And all you have to do is change your tutorial structure or reevaluate reevaluate your you know punishment and reward cycles. I mean, you know, that's all I was talking about. It was never was intended to be any kind of a treatise on the place of women in the industry at all. It was just it really was designed to help developers 
open up their markets and make better games. And yet for some male gamers, they do nonetheless feel threatened, like you're trying to take away their favorite toys. Boy, howdy, they sure do. I, I actually, yeah, it's things that have been said and things that have been done. I mean, I don't have it near as bad as some of the women who are just coming out today and some of the stuff that's happening where the attacks are just as vicious as anything I've ever seen. But and I, I often, I just don't understand that. What, you know, we're not, we're not trying. We just, we just want to play. We just want to play the games. You know, make it where we can help, where we can enjoy the games. I'm not, ask, like I said, I'm not asking you to, you know, add lipstick shopping to, you know, Call of Duty or something. I'm not. Just asking you. Do you want to make more money? Well, here's a way you can do it. Now, you mentioned some of the you know, vicious online attacks that occur nowadays, and that's actually something you tangentially address in your book, where there was a study about online education and forums and message boards and how yep. the male students tended to crowd out the female students. Yes. And, and, I, and I see that in my own demographics. My YouTube channel is you know, 85 to 90% male, even though the games I'm playing, like Super Mario Brothers, is a far cry from Far Cry. Right. Uh, and, and yes, there, and, and it's it's an attempt to silence. And and as I said, in, in this, the research was done by the research of Phoenix uh, University Online. And when they first started, they thought that having message boards would level the playing field, that online education would level the playing field. And they found that it actually didn't, uh, because the conversations in their in their chat rooms and in their forums took a nasty bend when the male students attempted to like you say, crowd out or silence the female voices, and they did it using sexual humor. Oh, and now we've graduated to sexual violence, the threats of sexual violence, and it's an attempt to silence the voice. It really is. It's nothing more than that. It's an attempt to silence the female voice. And to what end? I mean, you talk in your book about how males and females interact with technology differently and how some of that is based on the hunter-gatherer model where, you know, for example, hunters are better at picking out individual moving objects on a plane landscape, whereas women might prefer the find the hot spot on a game. Yeah. But none, none of that, to me, explains why men feel they have the right to be dicks. <laughs> I, you know, I have yet to figure that out myself. I, I don't really, I'm, I'm just blown away at every time. Like I said, it's like, are you guys really listening to what's being said here? Or did you just, you know, uh, listen to some, some other voice in your head that somehow told you you were being threatened? And I, I, I don't understand the threat because it's, it's like you know we just want to play too and we just want to to make more money selling more games, and then yet somehow it's this. Of course, it does a lot of it comes from the player base who don't, uh, who don't you know they don't benefit from selling more games. They're they're the player base and and they they seem to get very very upset when it's you know when girls want into the clubhouse and it's it's baffling to me. I I have never understood it. It makes me wonder how many of these gamers have wives or daughters. Uh, yeah, uh, you have to wonder that. Well, I've, I've always joked and said that developers change their tune really hard it, with me when they have a daughter. Mm -hmm. As soon as developers have a daughter, they'll come back to me and say, Sherry, I have a daughter. What game should I be looking at? I'm like, ah, now you come talk to me. Uh -huh, now I see. But I'm glad. I'm glad they do. At least they do that. So mm -hmm. at least they come back. What is the value other than financially in expanding the market? When I tell people I work in equality and diversity in the gaming industry, they say, wow, if I was interested in advocating for feminism, I wouldn't do so in the context of video games. That just doesn't seem very relevant to them. And it is just a pastime when we are talking about games. So what does gender equality matter in the entertainment industry like this? Um, well, beyond monetary, it's... Uh we need to not perpetuate a lot of the stereotypes. And this is where we kind of get into the more activism side of things. If we, if we start calling out and identifying the misogyny that are in a lot of these games, then we can, by hopefully by example, point it out in our daily day to day life. And maybe we can make the world a better place if we can kind of remove this, you know, hate and, and the misogyny that seems to be bubbling up in ugly ways in our entertainment. I, really, all you ever have to do is step back to what's been done with the race, you know, ra racial situations. You know, it's, it's like, well, why, why don't we have blackface anymore? Well, the reason we don't have blackface anymore is because it was a oppressive type of entertainment that, that called out and, and, 
you know, stigmatized and stereotyped, you know, a particular group of people. And we don't want to do that. And so it just, it's the same thing today in games, but it's, it's, you know, based around the treatment of women. Do you feel that the industry has become more or less accepting or inclusive of women in the last decade since the book came out? The industry? Yes. I, I can say pretty much without a doubt the industry has gotten a lot better. And I, I often describe it this way. The industry has made moves in the questions I get. Uh, the first questions I used to get in this were, you know, why are you even doing this? Women don't play games. You're, you're, you're tilting at windmills. Here. There's, there's no women that play games. And then we had Barbie fashion designer come out and sold 600,000 units right, you know, off the blocks. And suddenly everybody was going, oh, we want some of that. How do we make games? How do we make games for women? And then it kind of moved into, okay, how do we hire women? How do we hire women? And so it's kind of been this evolution. And we're still in this, how do we hire more women? And now it's how do we find qualified women? And how do we, how do we make sure that, you know, we ha- have as broad a candidate pool as possible when we're hiring? And that's, that's really been nice to see that evolution. Because uh, in the beginning, we really were fighting the women don't play computer games. Which I say this now to some of the, when I speak to student groups and stuff, and they, they just look at me like I'm talking about World War II or something. They cannot imagine a world where anybody would say women don't play computer games. But it was a real, you know, honest opinion. The industry held that the women didn't play games. And, well, we've since, of course, proven that. It's right. not true. Uh, I interviewed Al Lowe a couple of weeks ago, or actually a couple of months ago, about the Leisure Suit Larry games. And he said that actually he found that many women played his game because he felt the female characters in that game were stronger than the male protagonist. The male protagonist was a real loser. And the women were, you know, these strong, smart, beautiful, educated women. Now, I didn't point out to him that that doesn't change the fact that the women in the game were being objectified because they were still the object of the game. But he did have a point that they were, in a way, better people than the male character. Well, also, well, the whole Leisure Suit Larry thing is, is interesting, too. If you go back to the Pyramid of Power, it's allowing the steps down the pyramid to poke fun at the steps above them on the pyramid in a safe way. So... I hadn't thought of it that way. I didn't have that pyramid of power structure sure, in mind sure, when I interviewed yeah, Mr. Lowe. Sure. Interesting. Yeah, it's a way to poke fun above you and, and do it in a safe way. Now, the industry may be more inclusive of women, but you mentioned that, well, actually, let me step back. When I interviewed Sean Alexander Allen for this show, he said that uh, one reason that there aren't many minorities in the indie game development scene is because they don't see protagonists that they can identify with, protagonists that represent their demographic. Well, I, I would actually uh, say that that's not the truth anymore. Uh, I actually sponsored the indie Minority Indie Game Summit, or I guess not Summit, Roundtable at GDC this year, and we had three sessions, and they were stacked to standing room only. I actually think that the indie place is the place where the minority uh, game developer can come and develop games outside of the constraints of the traditional industry. Uh, they can do what they want. They can bring their life experience to the games that might not that might be silenced in some of the bigger houses that are really pushing for that very traditional market, that very traditional game. And so, I'm actually very excited about the indie uh, market and the opportunity for minority developers. No, I think you're absolutely right. That scene more so than the mainstream AAA titles will definitely absolutely. be where we see that innovation occurs. Yep. Um, but what does this mean for female developers in the mainstream industry? They may not necessarily see protagonists they can identify with in the games. And one way to correct that is to get more female developers making games that they would want to play. But that seems, yep. sounds like a catch-22. So which comes first, the it, female it used protagonist to be. or the developer? It used to be. And uh, we have, as far as, in my opinion, we have the school systems to thank for them having more women available. Uh, Because we have a lot of schools that have game development programs now, and a lot of those schools are public schools, which are by law supposed to have a diverse student base, there are a lot of schools out there that are actively looking for female student candidates. And that, of course, is then producing women who come out of these schools with degrees in game development and understanding it and is and they're stepping into the industry, expecting it to be more like their daily life. Uh, And... And I think, and I, I really believe that's a, playing a really big part in changing the face of our industry. It's the fact that the latest, according to the latest IGDA 
survey, it's, the industry is now 22% female. It's compared to 11% female from their last survey. It's compared to less than 3% when I started in the industry. I think that big jump is really almost directly a result of the school systems producing candidates for us that we can interview. Now, I have seen camps and programs and schools set up for women in gaming and for women to learn how to program. And the female developers I know think that's great. But then there may be a discrepancy where when they see various game tournaments where it's structured so that men play against men and women play against women, yeah. and that's not considered fair. So, I, I mean, I, no. I agree that one is good for women developers and one is not, but I'd like to hear your explanation for why that may be. Is, is one sexist and the other isn't? Uh, well, yeah, it's exclusive by having a, a competition where it's a level playing field. Um, I, I, girls can use controllers just like boys can use controllers. There, it's a level. It's just not like we're trying to, you know, play football with men who are actually physiologically bigger than women and have a different muscle structure. Uh, where so the women would be more women are at a disadvantage, not to say women shouldn't play football. They absolutely should if they can compete with them. But, there's nothing about that in gaming. Why in the world would you be segregated? There's, there's nothing. It's a level playing field. So it, it's very exclusive. And, and by telling the women, we're back to this, telling the women that if you're not welcome here, then you're not welcome playing games. And, and that's just really bad for our industry. Anytime we tell a particular, a, a, a particular market segment, particularly one as big as women, 52% of the population in the United States. Uh, we, why would we ever want to tell them that you're not welcome playing our games? That's ridiculous. So why segregate the schools and camps then? Why have one that's just for women? To give the women and to give the women the opportunity to learn. One of the things we know about women coming into these programs, and this was, uh, there was a, I really wish I had that. I need to find that email. One of the things we know about women coming into these programs is they come in uh, at a disadvantage with their background of knowledge and technology. They do not, they do not, they're not the, the guy that got the computer when he was eight years old and started hacking and making programs. They come in not having done that. So if you put them in a competitive situation or school situation where they're trying to get, get grades against that guy who's been programming since he was eight, they're at a distinct disadvantage. So we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to to work at the level that they are without feeling embarrassed or discomfited in any way or, or simply being pushed aside because the guy that's been doing it since he was eight is so much better and so much faster. We want to give them the opportunity to do that. We also want to give them, it's much like our Women in Games conferences, we want to give them the opportunity to find their voice. And particularly in a subject like this where it is a very strongly male-dominant area, this gives them the opportunity to find their voice and to find their courage to be able to step up and make the things and do the things that they want to do and try and experiment with the different roles on the teams and things. So I, I like the concepts of camps. Now, if they were the only camps out there and they were only the only camps available were camps for women, I would say, no, that's not right. It needs to be you know, more open. I'd like to see the general camps do a lot more reaching out to female uh, part that participants, you know, that might be candidates to participate in it, really reaching out and trying to diversify the gender of their campers. You know, we'll see what they do about that. I actually, there's a couple of camps here in Austin that I've worked with specifically with that goal to make sure that they have girls know that, that the girls know that they are welcome to attend and that they want them there, that they're wanted there. So it's okay to have a women's only environment as long as it's their choice to participate. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. And if they want to go into the other one that they're welcome to as well, and for that matter, you know, if they want to do a boys-only camp, that would be fine too, as long as somewhere there's a, a co-ed version that's available. Gotcha. So a gaming tournament, for example, could have a men's, women's, and co-ed leagues, and anybody can choose which one they want to join. Um, actually, when you get back to the sports league, I just say make it a level playing field. Or I would actually, if I were going to break it down, it's really funny that you asked me this because this is something I'm working with in an entirely different world. Uh, have you can break it down in other ways years of experience how long have you been playing number of tournaments you've attended uh number of tournaments you've won if you won so many tournaments then you're in the a division worse if you haven't you're in the b division or you're in the green division versus the purple division i mean don't rank it so that people are playing against people of a level skill i would break it that way and i just forget the gender thing altogether 
Because hmm. and and it's funny because I I I don't know if you know this, but my hobby is uh, I race cars. Uh, there's no women's division because it's a level playing field. I, I it's a it's a Corvette. I drive my Corvette. You have a Corvette. You drive your Corvette. We compete against each other because I can drive my Corvette just as much or you know as well as you can, and you can drive just as well as I can. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. So. Um, but yet we're still looking at a way to break the competition down so people are competing against people of their skill level. And that's a, so it's, I'd rather see it broken that way than to label a gender on it. There's no reason to. You know, as a brief aside, I don't know that I have enough data points here to establish a trend, but you're the third female developer I know who races cars for fun. Oh, yeah. Then there's Kiki. Who else? Uh, Quinn Dunkey and Jerry Ellsworth. I didn't know Cherry Ray, so I'm going to have to give her a hard time. And Kiki Wolf kills the other ones. There's at least four of us. Oh, my. So any explanation for why that might be? What's the appeal? What's the commonality? I don't know that there's any particular reason. Um, I just think that there's – because there's a number of women in motorsports, and just there's a percentage, and here we are. We just happen to be in the games. I mean, you probably find some in banking or other stuff, too. It's just there happens to be <laughs> those of us here. You just happen to be very visible – Members of oh, the yes. industry. Yeah, of the industry, yeah. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully more visible in my racing. <laughs> <laughs> Not as quite as fast as I want to be yet. You'll get there. I hope so. I know a couple of female developers who feel that they have overcome disadvantages and an industry that is hostile to them, and they need to make sure that it's easier for those who follow in their footsteps. And yep. so they may actually give preference to female candidates during the hiring process or even establish an all women's studio, not that that's necessarily intentional that they're excluding men. They just happen to hire women. Is that a form of reverse sexism? Uh, I wouldn't label it as such, but I would consider it to not be the best business decision. And here's the really fun part. We have, uh, there have been diversity programs in fortune 500 companies now for over 25 years. What that means is we have a lot of data on what diversity programs do. And what they have found is diverse boards of directors, diverse teams do better than single gender, either way. And not just diverse in form of gender, race, uh, ability, uh, orientation, lifestyle orientation. It, it's when you have a diverse team, you get better products. And they're really great. And I get very excited about this because it's, it's just, it's what we need as an industry. One of the places that they absolutely call out is they have improvements when they have a diverse team is they have improvements in creativity and innovation. And that's what this industry thrives on. Our game industry thrives on creativity and innovation. And we'll get more of that and better if we have diverse teams. Whether, so, so that's what we should be striving for is the best our industry can be. Uh, you've, you've, met, you've worked on several games over the years, some of which I mentioned, Ultima, Star Wars Galaxies. And I'm wondering how would those games have been different had a male developer been in your shoes? In what way did you influence those games? <laughs> they would never have had to hear anybody say, but what if the player is female? <laughs> Which is pretty much my battle cry in every team I've ever been on. It's, it's just like, hey, 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 what if, what if the player is female? And that usually, sometimes it elicits laughter, sometimes it elicits groans, and sometimes they start having design meetings and not telling me. <laughs> really? Yes, I actually had that happen where Sherry had to play hunt the design meeting because they wouldn't tell me where the design meeting was because <laughs> they got tired of me asking. So, but what if the player is female? So I just think that we would, we would, you know, we, I would like to think that maybe the, the, some of the areas of some of the barriers might not have been as addressed as, as in the games that I've worked on. So very specifically, I can tell you in Star Wars Galaxies, I worked on the tutorial. And I worked very hard to try to open that up and make sure that we were addressing different learning styles and different modes of uh, knowledge acquisition to make sure that people felt comfortable on ramping into the game. So, I mean, I did that very purposefully. Okay. What are some other games that have come out in the past decade since your book came out that you feel have gotten it right? Very few, unfortunately. Um, I loved the tutorial in EverQuest 2. I thought they did a really good job. Um, I thought character creation in City of Heroes was brilliant because you could build exactly what you wanted without only being given a hypersexualized version to build. Um, so I guess I could say bits and pieces of things were done very right. Um, and then some of them, but I don't know that I could put my finger and say, there, that game, that's the one. Uh, 
I mean, you can reach into some of the more esoteric. You can reach out to like Journey. That was a beautiful game. Uh, so I think they did an awful lot right in Journey. So there's things like that. But I would be hard pressed to say, here, this one game is the paragon that I should hold up that we should all aspire to be. I think that we're all still striving for improvement in everything we do. As primarily a console gamer, I was hoping you would mention Journey or maybe even Portal. Portal, yeah, Portal's a good one, except that, except for, uh, I, I don't mention Portal um, because I get motion sick. Oh, no. I, I do. I get motion sick, and I never was able to finish it as badly as I wanted to. I couldn't even watch the Let's Play videos. I get motion sick. And we do know that a higher percentage of women get motion sick than men do. And so what does this say? Yeah. I am so excited to hear that the Oculus Rift is actually working on the nausea problem because it's like, yes, that that's it. Because it's not just me. It's not just women to get motion sick. Guys do too. So if you fix that problem, look at that barrier you bring down. Interesting. I don't. Did that come up in the book? Because I think I might have missed mm-hmm. that chapter. No, no, no. That, that, I didn't talk about the whole motion sickness thing because I didn't have the facts and the numbers for it yet. I wanted to. I think I might mention the one study that Yasmin was doing up at MIT, or, but I didn't have the final results on it, so I didn't. I probably didn't. Because I know you talked about how men have a physiological response to visual stimuli that women may not, and that women right. more receive uh, reactions to tactile feedback, like tactile force and, feedback. And it, tactile and emotional. Yeah. If you want the same physiological response that you get, the, the male physiological response of that, in, that uh, you know, increased a respiration, increased heart rate, increased perspiration, if you want that same response in women, you've got to do it tactile or emotional, mm. which is, as I said in the book, which is why a guy will play the fighting game over and over for that big visual, you know, ripping the head out or doing a big visual explosion, and a girl will go see Titanic 15 times. It's that same emotional, it's that same exact visceral feeling. Only she gets it through the emotion and he gets it through the visual. And we know this. We can use this as a tool. (laughs) I was really surprised to hear you tout tactile feedback because as a male gamer, I always considered it more of a gimmick. Like the first time I played Metal Gear Solid and they tell me to put the controller on my arm and I get a massage. I'm like, that's, you know, that wasn't, it was neat, but it didn't sell me on the game. It didn't make the game more accessible. Right, but it does for women. Why do you, and I think I talk about in the book too, this is why you see arcades going to the ride on games. Yes. You much did more so. That. Yeah. It's, it's because arcades 10 years ago, 15 years ago, realized that they had to broaden their market because they were losing their market share. And they knew they had to broaden their market. So they had to start reaching out to women and to families. And one of the big things they did was add the big tactile rides. Well, isn't that also why they made Miss Pac Man? That's a whole long story. <laughs> that's a whole long story for a whole other discussion. But uh, that's a, 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 that's one of the stories. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just slap a bow on it, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot more different in Ms. Pac-Man than just the bow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I think actually Anita Sarkeesian may have done a whole video about that. Yes, I think she did. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, you know, I had so many questions on my list, and normally. I, uh, the conversations I've, I'm usually able to structure, so we just go down the list, but we have just been bouncing all around because everything you bring up is so fascinating. I'm like, ooh, let's go explore that more deeply. Sure. Well, thank uh, you. I mean, it's, well, there- it's a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, and I love to talk about it. And, and I, I always just hope that people will come away with ideas of ways they can make better games based on what I'm – because at my heart, I'm a game designer. That's, that's what I do. It's what I love. I eat breathe, sleep, dream games. And if I can help people to make better, broader market, you know, games that really reach out to more people, that's a win for me. So I love talking about this stuff. Can you tell us about any games you're working on now? What can I talk about now? Without I, I, violating I, NDA. Yeah, everything is so NDA. Uh, I really, there's really, I've got a, I've got a, a PC game I'm working on that's aimed kind of at the female market, sort of. I mean, that's all of that kind of stuff I can tell you. <laughs> I've got a, several kids games I work. I do a lot of consulting and a lot of a lot of con- contract work. So I've got a couple of really exciting kids titles coming up that I'm very excited when they'll. We should be seeing some reports back from some of our beta testing soon that I'm very excited about. But I have to be vague. You know, we keep saying we're going to make T-shirts for this industry that say. Uh, on the on the front, they say big letters NDA, and on the back it says, uh, "No, I, yes, it's going to be great. No, I can't tell you." <laughs> <laughs> it's like the way we all talk at game conferences. It's going to be great. I can't tell you any more than that. Are there any game conferences coming up at which people might find you? 
I will be at South by Southwest. Uh, I will be at GDC. Uh, I am talking with the folks about being at the ECGC, which is the East Coast Game Conference, Richard Dansky and his group that do out there. So those are the, those are kind of my three that are coming up. I'm going to be down at Full Sail University in October down there. I, I, I'm on their advisory board, so I go down there quite often. So I'll be down there in October talking to the students, which I love. I love talking to students. Uh, so that's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in Norway in November talking to some classes over there. So, yeah, lots of fun stuff. What about PAX South? I don't know about PAX South. Um, I'm really careful with the whole PAX issue. I, I never was... I never was satisfied with the result of their issues that they had, so I've kind of stepped back. Um, I don't put in to speak there. If somebody asked me to be on a panel or something, I would consider it. But no, that's I'm, understandable. I, yeah, I'm the same way with Dice. Uh, since Dice, I asked the guys at Dice one time why they didn't have female keynote speakers, and they told me it was because there were no female speakers they felt could draw well enough for them. Really? Yeah. So I kind of okay. That's that's very narrow-minded. Yeah. <laughs> really well, that's one of the battles we fight quite often. A lot of the big game conferences, go look and see how many have female keynotes. I'm really surprised and disappointed by that. Yeah, I was too. I was too. Now, they have to, at the time when I talked to them was several years ago, and they didn't have any women on their advisory board either. And their speaker panels, I don't think, their speaker list was like, you know, one or two females. So they've actually, that's been improving. So I'm very, I'm happy that they're making those steps and improving. I would like to see them bring in a female keynote. I, you know, I think that would be a big step. Mm -hmm. There's one annual conference I attend, which is focused, it, it's a hobbyist convention for old computers, the Apple II specifically. Oh, and this event just celebrated its 26th year. Very often the keynote speakers come from the industry of 30 years ago, which has a right. very different demographic makeup than we do now. Absolutely. And after 26 years, we finally had our first keynote speaker who was a woman. Uh, that yes. being uh, Margot Comstock, who published Soft Talk magazine. Yep. Yep. Ah, very good. Congratulations. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's hard. Um, yeah, you have to dig around. It, it took me a while. We, found Don we finally found uh, Donna Bailey who did Centipede, and we brought her in for the uh, first time. We finally found her in Arkansas, and she has totally had totally left the industry and wasn't interested in talking to anybody about it. And uh, we managed to get her to come out and speak at the Women in Games Conference here in Austin when we were doing it in conjunction with the Austin Game Conference. And we brought her down to speak as a keynote, and that was really exciting for us. And now, since then, she's come out and spoken at a number of different Women in Games uh, events, and I'm very happy that we... We gave her the courage that she could come out and speak again. So oh, wonderful. She's, she's the nicest lady, the nicest lady. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of the Women in Games Conference, for women who want to get into the industry or are looking for more support in the, in the industry, other than joining the Women in Games International organization you co-founded, what resources do you recommend pointing them to? The IGDA's Women in Game Development uh, SIG the mailing list. Take in digest form. It's incredibly busy, but it is it is where you will find, because again, remember, Women in Games International also uses that as their main mouthpiece. And you will find everybody there. You will you will find people, you know, me that have been around forever. You'll find students, you'll find artists and writers and producers and HR people and uh, you'll find a lot of people there and a lot of support. And it's very important to find others so you find some, find your voice and, and find others who understand your viewpoint and share your viewpoint. Wonderful. And where can we find you online? Uh, oh, several places. You can find me at zombiecatstudios.com or sherrygrainerray.com. And I, I'm usually on the Women in Games uh, list as well. Are you on social media? Oh, yes. I'm social media. You'll find me on Facebook and find me on, on Twitter at Don't Do What I Did. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Twilight1. It's T-W-Y-L-I-T-E-1. Don't do that. Use your real name. I didn't <laughs> because I didn't understand. I was just kind of sticking my toe in to see what Twitter was all about. And um, so I used my, my favorite gamer name. And uh, yeah, so don't do that. But that's <laughs> you'll find me as Twilight One, and it has nothing to do with the Twilight books. I was Twilight is a gaming name of mine from way, way, way back. Uh, yeah, and Facebook, of course, Sherry Grainer Ray, and LinkedIn. You'll find me in all those places. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been one of my favorite conversations for this cool. podcast. Wow, oh, fantastic. I mean, anytime, anytime. Like I said, I love to talk about this stuff. And I'm very much looking forward to the next edition of your book. Please yes. come out with it soon. 
I'm I'm trying. I'm trying. It's uh it's we have to deal with you know, how the legal the move legal moves slowly. Yes. But, but, but it is coming. It will and, come. I'm going and to for those it. and for those who can't wait, this first edition is may not be in print, but you can still find it at a multitude of libraries. You certainly can. You can also still find it on Amazon. You can find it used. That's fine. Buy it used. Anything. i have just you know. And anybody has any questions, they're welcome to, you know, stop by my my blog and drop me a note. I'm happy to answer questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Sherry. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.